Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's update and technical briefing on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue à cette mise à jour, puis notre séance d'information technique. So this afternoon, participating in the technical briefing will be Dr. Gordon Dow, Infectious Specialist, Horizon Health Network. Matthew Shalifo, lead COVID-19 epidemiologist with Public Health. Dr. France de Rosier, president and chief executive officer of Vitalité Health Network. And Dr. John Dornan, interim president and executive officer of Horizon Health. Aujourd'hui, pour notre séance d'information technique, les personnes suivantes vont vous adresser à la parole. Le spécialiste des maladies infectieuses, le réseau santé de Horizon, le Dr. Gordon Dahl. L'épidémiologiste principal de la COVID-19 avec la santé publique Nouveau-Brunswick, M. Matthew Chalifeur. La présidente directrice générale du réseau de santé Vitalité, Dr. France Desrosiers. Et le président directeur général par intérim du réseau de santé Horizon, M. Dr. John Dornan. On va commencer avec M. Chalifeu. We'll start with Mr. Chalifeu. Good afternoon, everyone. For the past two weeks, We've observed the number of COVID-19 cases in our province grow at a rapid pace. In fact, at this time, each recorded case is now generating another 1.5 new cases on average. While we've seen this level of growth before, we certainly have not seen it in such a sustained manner throughout the entire province. Durant le mois de septembre, nous avons... During September, up to yesterday, we found 866 cases in the province. This is almost 25% of all reported cases in New Brunswick since the beginning of the pandemic. 38 people were hospitalized during September with COVID-19, and unfortunately, two died. Reminder of the great cost of not taking this disease seriously. But how did we get here? You should see on your screen a network of 700 cases that were recorded between September 1st and September 21st. Note the large clusters populating the middle. One of these events would have occurred towards the beginning of the month, congregating a very large number of individuals. To date, we have found evidence of 64 such individuals attending that event, which does not include those whom they would have unwittingly transmitted the disease to. As you can see, the vast majority of these would have been unvaccinated. And actually, the vast majority of our clusters and cases during this time period were in primarily unvaccinated individuals. De ces 64 cas reliés à cet événement, of the 560 cases that were linked, we were able to direct to trace cases in regions 1, 3, 5, and 7. All the eligible spe specimens were tested for Delta, and it is now the predominant variant in the province. In fact, more than 85% of all the samples uh, between uh, the 1st and 19 September of September have revealed to be Delta-related. It will enter through your home, and it will go through a cycle where it spreads from your household to the events which you attend, you and your household members attend. From the person to the child, to the school, to the workplace, and everywhere in between. And the activities from everyone can and will become exposure sites until they are isolated. 
You've seen the large list of exposures that we have communicated this month. And the virus will provide as many exhibits as we require to show that it is with us and it has no intention of leaving. Thank you. Bonjour, mes amis. Hi, friends. I'm uh, pleased to present to you today. Fellow New Brunswickers, um, I am here today to tell you about the COVID-19 Delta variant. This is not the same virus that was circulating around the globe one year ago. Delta was first identified in India in December of 2020. And since then, it has become the predominant coronavirus in over 200 countries around the world. The World Health Organization has stated that it's the fastest spreading and most infectious variant identified so far. I am sure that you are growing weary uh, hearing about any virus, especially this one. But please bear with me as this story has both good news and bad news. I always like to get the bad news over with first, so I hope you won't mind, and we'll just get right through that. Um, there are four bad things about this Delta variant. The first one is that it's twice as infectious as the original variant that was discovered in China back in 2019. Now, twice as infectious may not sound like much to you, but because this virus spreads um, in, in a, in a uh, exponential fashion, twice as infectious is very significant. As an example, if you had a completely unvaccinated population with one person with Delta variant, um, uh, sorry, one person with the original strain of the virus, they would, after a four-week period, infect 27 other people. With the Delta variant, that single person would infect 216 people over the same period of time. So that's what twice as infectious means. This variant is more infectious because it's in much higher uh, numbers in our respira respiratory secretions. The, the studies to date have shown that the virus exists uh, in numbers that are a thousand times higher than levels identified with the original strain of the virus. The second thing this virus does is it binds to our cells much better. And think of it as a, being a stickier virus. This, this virus sticks to our cells better. So those two things, having high amounts of virus and respiratory secretions, and the virus being stickier means it's twice as infectious. So that's the first thing you should know about Delta virus. The second thing is because it's more infectious, it has a shorter incubation period. So what's an incubation period? The incubation period is the time it takes to develop symptoms after you first become infected with the virus. The original strain of the coronavirus had an incubation period of six days. The Delta variant has an incubation period of only four days. Why is this important? Well, this is important because we have less time to contact trace and isolate people who have come into contact with the virus. So we have to be very nimble and fast to get this under control. So it's twice as infectious, and it has a more rapid spread because of this uh, shorter incubation period. The third piece of bad news is one dose of vaccine is not effective for this virus. You need to have two doses of vaccine to gain protection. And the fourth piece of bad news is the Delta variant appears to be more likely to lead to hospitalization and death, if, especially if you're unvaccinated, uh, compared to the older strains. So those are the four, four things you need to know about the Delta var variant. That's how it's different from the original virus. Let's switch to good news. So the first thing you should know is two doses of COVID vaccine works incredibly well for this virus to protect you from getting infected. Um, it's 90% uh, protective against hospitalization and death, so it's really good at preventing severe disease. Currently in Canada, 
because the vaccine is so effective, 90% of those with COVID-19 are unvaccinated. Also in Canada, um, if you're unvaccinated, you're 12 times more likely to get infected and 36 times more likely to go to hospital. So vaccination works. Uh, but the problem we have right now is in a province like New Brunswick, oh, only about 70% of the total population uh, are fully vaccinated. So that's like having a suit of armor that only covers 70% of your body. So what do you do? You bring in another defense. So what you need when your suit of armor only covers 70% of your body, you need a shield. So what's the shield? It's public health measures. And the same public health measures that work for the old variant will work for this variant. This is really good news. Everything we did before and did so effectively works for this virus. We will need to vaccinate 90% of the total population for optimal community protection. So until that happens, it will be absolutely essential that we continue to follow a menu of simple public health guidelines. Every province in Canada is currently drafting and applying these public health measures, and these measures may include any number of the following. Registering and quarantining unvaccinated travelers, because that's how the Delta gets into your province. Mandating vaccines for specific groups of employees, you wouldn't want a healthcare professional looking after you that wasn't vaccinated. Requiring proof of vaccination for non-essential activities. Masking while you're indoors because most transmission occurs in crowded indoor locales. Reducing, reducing your social networks. The less people you are in contact with, the less transmission occurs. Physical distancing. If you're in a room with a lot of people, keeping a two meter distance is very protective. The other really, really important thing is testing, contact tracing, and isolating persons with high risk exposure to the virus. Our public health is superb at this, and they will continue to apply this. And finally, regardless of whether we are in a pandemic or not, there are some behaviors that Dr. Russell has told us about that should never go away. They're just basic good behaviors. This includes washing your hands regularly, covering your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze, staying home from work or school if you're sick, getting tested if you have symptoms. And uh, one of the most important things Dr. Russell reminds us at the end of all of her deliveries is being kind to one another. So think of vaccination like a suit of armor and public health safety guidelines like a shield. You need vaccination and you need a shield. And with that combination of two defenses, you will be protected and we will protect the young and the old, the healthy and the unhealthy, the rich and the poor, the North and the South, our local businesses, our education system, and our healthcare system. I'm extremely proud of the hard work and sacrifice New Brunswickers have made over the past 18 months. The Delta variant will definitely come under control as long as we continue to work together. Thank you very much. Bonjour. Hello. We are, we know the, we feel the precious, the pressure by the sadness in our community is caused by this uh, fourth wave of this pandemic. And we are also quite concerned about the fatigue of our people of our staff and the high usage of our of the high usage of our services the these people chose to care for people and you're lucky that they did but it's important to know that we are juggling every year with demand that is going beyond our capacities for example to properly uh, take in to do all the uh, screening caused by this, the the need for tracing during this fourth way this fourth wave, we have to free staff from other sectors. But we are already working in a system, and we have to say this, great 
uh, challenges when it comes to human resources. So unfortunately, we have to continuously relocate our people. We have f closed beds in hospitals that are already overflowing. We have sent uh, ambulances from one emergency room to another. We've limited visiting in emergency rooms and we've reduced services to patients. For example, we've had to cancel surgeries. We've had to reduce uh, the managing chronic diseases. And, uh, and also initiatives for investigating health problems. So our message for all our citizens who could be vaccinated is don't forget all of the patients that have health challenges and for which uh, things will be delayed due to the pandemic. All of our immunodepressed uh, patients that have a higher risk of dying from COVID and think about your own fragile health system. The elastic has been stretched beyond be repair. We only have nine people hospitalized and but this is lots of this is very hard in vitality, but we're going to continue to take care of our patients, but we have to rely on our communities to stop the fourth wave. So I want to thank all the citizens that are double vaccinated and who give us hope. Thanks to all of those who think about the weakest people among them and their communities. Hello, I'm John Dornan. I'm the uh, interim president and CEO of Horizon Health Network. You know, a few months back, uh, we would see cases of COVID, the Alpha variant, in our hospitals. And we would look at people down in Moncton or Fredericton or St. John, and we would be thankful that it seemed to hit one hospital at a time. They would work their way through it, get out of the dilemma, and then we would wait for the next hospital to be hit. And it was, um, it was quasi acceptable. And now we have the Delta variant. And let me tell you about an experiment. The experiment is over. We have had a significant fraction of our population, 70% plus, have the vaccination. And they are not presenting to our hospitals any more often than the typical person would for illnesses, surgeries, and the like. And then we have the control group, folks that have decided, as is their right, to not have the vaccination. And we are seeing that those folks are getting sick. They're getting the COVID virus. And it's not a simple virus that keeps you home for a few days. Folks get that virus. They pass it to their sisters, their mothers, their fathers, and their children. And some of these people get sick. We have 23 people in the Horizon Network right now in hospital with a COVID virus. Eight people are in our ICU. You say, well, you've got lots of capacity. You can tolerate that. But here, let me tell you what happens on a personal level. When you come in with a COVID virus and you require special attention and ICU care, your mother, who has been waiting for surgery for seven months, has her surgery canceled because we do not have room in our operating theaters. You have an uncle who needs heart surgery and needs to go to an ICU after heart surgery. We have no room in the ICU. So this has a very personal impact on our community. Today, we had to announce that we were closing temporarily the obstetrics unit in the Upper River Valley Hospital. You could go and be met and cared for by a very good team of physicians, obstetricians, family doctors that could deliver your baby. Now we do not have the resources to support that unit together with ICU, where we have three patients with COVID, the floors, the operating theaters, and the emergency departments. We have no choice but to reappoint our resources so that there's a real impact on mothers that have now to travel to Fredericton to give birth to their babies. So it's very personal. A lot of people are suffering through our impact through the number of people that come in with COVID. The experiment is over. We know that when you are not vaccinated, you or your loved ones will get sick, and that will have a direct impact on the rest of our community. We're in a fragile state of affairs. We would encourage people to become vaccinated. Uh, if you don't, if you're not vaccinated, 
Be sure that you protect yourselves and your community by wearing masks, washing hands, and staying away from other people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, 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 and Mr. Shalifu. Merci beaucoup à toi, Doctor, Mr. Shalifu. We're going to try and get in some questions from members of the media. Each reporter will have one question and a quick follow up. You have the right to pose your questions in the lang official language of your choice. If you could be short and succinct with your questions, we will try and get everybody in with two questions. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. We will now go on with the question from reporters. You can ask the questions in language of your choice. Each reporter will have one question and one follow-up. And please be brief and succinct. Um, Dr. Dow, it was said before we went to the green phase that we, would, we could expect more cases. Uh, did, how many did we expect? Have we surpassed what we expected? And if we have surpassed what we expected, when did we surpass it? Um, those are, those are uh, public health questions. Um, those are really not questions that I would normally deal with in my work as an infectious disease specialist. But I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. So why don't we start with the first? Oh. Oh. Was there a number? Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yes, uh, great question, Mr. Poitra. Thank you for asking it. Um, we've maintained for some time that uh, a rise in cases was not unexpected um, and that New Brunswick couriers were encouraged to learn to live with the disease uh, as we headed into the fall. Uh, at this point in time, I I would say that it's the growth, the rapidity at which uh, it is occurring that um, is, is kind of overwhelming uh, what is currently happening. And as you've heard from uh, Dr. Dornan and Dr. Desrosiers, uh, our hospital systems haven't quite been able to deal with the surge the way that it has without affecting other services. But in terms of uh, cases continuing, uh, that is something that we, we've messaged before and, and that I'll maintain we expected. Okay. Um, maybe I can ask it another way. Um, you're, you're all scientific or medical professionals. Can each of you indicate whether you think that eliminating all restrictions on July 30th was a sound scientific medical decision? I'll go first. Um, so that decision is uh, outside the scope of what our practice is. That's a government decision. Decisions are made at a different point in time based on the data that's uh, available at that point in time. And certainly uh, through the summer, uh, we had very few cases and uh, a lot of promising data from vaccines throughout. Everything Dr. Dow said about Delta, we knew on July 30th. Gentlemen, ladies, do you want to add? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think absolutely. I mean, all of us in this room right now with the... Uh, with the evidence of this rapid increase in Delta virus in the province, we'd all agree that was not the right decision to make. But that's with the benefit of, in retrospect, right? So getting, so everyone here would agree with that. So the big question is, would we have done anything different? Was that the right decision to make at that time? And it's always hard to speculate because many other jurisdictions made the very same mistake. Alberta made this mistake, except they made it a month before us. Saskatchewan made the mistake. The United States made the mistake. Uh, the UK made the mistake. So when you see it, there was a lot, of, a lot of mistakes made. And you know what? That's okay, because pandemics are all about making mistakes. What I like to look at is the fact that this province has had one of the most aggressive approaches to COVID anywhere in the world. We've used what's called an elimination strategy. And because we used an elimination strategy, we've had seven distinct outbreaks uh, in the province. What's interesting is we shut every one of them down. This one, did we, did we undercall this one? I would say yes. And I think most New, New Brunswickers would agree with that. 
I, yes, we did. But I would also say that we got it right 85% of the time. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pivot and we'll bring this under control. Tim Rosell, Global. Thank you, Bruce. My question is for uh, Dr. Dow. Uh, Dr. Dow, how much of a game changer has Delta been? It's almost been like um, this is almost like a like a new pandemic or a, a you know a, a sort of a second phase of it because the the earlier variants all had uh, similarities uh, but slight differences. This one seems to be kind of off that chart a little bit. Is that fair to say? It's definitely fair to say. Um, uh, viruses uh, mutate at a very predictable rate, and the thing that predicts how many mutations you see is the number of people um, that are unprotected by vaccination and public health measures. So if you look around the globe, where probably there's less than 20 percent vaccine coverage globally, that is a, an incubator for variants like this. And this of, uh, of the four major variants described so far, this one's definitely the one that's best adapted at infecting people. It's, it's more infectious, it spreads faster, it spreads more easily. So yes, this is quite a bit different from the first virus, but on the other hand, the same public health measures that worked for the last one works for this one. This virus can't go anywhere without a person on two legs to take it there. And because of that, it's controllable. Do have a quick follow-up, uh, Tim? Yeah, quick follow-up for Dr. Dow. Um, is the, or, or are the differences between Delta and the earlier variants, um, are they making it more difficult for uh, perhaps a, a segment of the population to, to rationalize being vaccinated? They might just look around and say, you know what, people are getting vaccinated and they're still getting infected. Why should I get vaccinated now? Are we seeing, you know, the, that level of doubt increasing perhaps or, or strengthened in some of those people? You're absolutely right. And, and what this requires is solid communication. I would say that, you know, as an infectious disease specialist, me and people like me are terrible at communicating the realities of vaccination. So vaccination in children is usually designed to prevent getting infection. But vaccination in adults usually doesn't prevent the vax, doesn't prevent infection. What it does is it attenuates infection. So in other words, you get the virus, but you don't get sick and die from it. Our influenza vaccine is a good example. Influenza vaccine, we all know, is terrible at preventing influenza. It reduces influenza, you know, maybe in a good year by 50%, um, and in a bad year by 10, 20%. But it prevents hospitalization and death by well over 50%. So this vaccine is much better than our influenza vaccine. So I think the thing we have to do is communicate better that this vaccine works. It's not perfect. It's, got, it's, going, it's not going to give you 100% protection, but it's going to give you very good protection. And what I could foresee in the future is that we will be able to control this virus the same way we control influenza. I would speculate that we'll be having an annual influenza and COVID vaccine, for example, because that's what works for influenza. That will work for this. Alexander Boudreau, Lacadie Nouvelle. So do you expect that for people not to respect as much the new measures because we launched the uh, green phase in July? For Mr. Shalifou, maybe? Thank you very much. So there's a level of confidence that comes with uh, managing the pandemic. I believe that New Brunswick, since the beginning, has tried to put in place measures that uh, reflect the level of confidence and the res respect that we find uh, in uh, the province, meaning that we're all together in order to control um, outbreaks and reduce them when it's possible. Obviously, to be in, in a green phase, it sends a mes message, but with this message, we try to, to communicate clearly and uh, continuously the importance of living with COVID-19 and to take the necessary measures 
responsible measures that come with it. And at this point, I don't know if this was uh, truly uh, accepted by the people of New Brunswick. That was the wish. But if I would uh, uh, start over again, I would trust the people of, of New Brunswick as much as possible. Still, we're still in the green phase, technically, but there are new measures in place. So m people might be a little confused regarding that. Yes, it is a possibility. However, regarding the communication that we do on the um, public health uh, sector, it's as clear as possible. And regarding the way that they're communicated, well, I can't say anything. As I said earlier, a lot of the data that's, that you're talking about today isn't exactly new, but what can be done today? What, uh, you know, what are the next steps following today? Uh, um, would you mind uh, repeating the question, please? Um, you know, you're, you're talking about you know the the mandatory order regulations that you, we have here. Um, how just break down how this is going to work? What's going to be done like after today, today, and forward? I actually, I actually don't know because uh, I, I'm not part of uh, that planning. I, uh, so I, I, I'm afraid that I'm not sure. But I, what I am sure is that there will be. Uh, a slate of good recommendations coming. Follow up, Allison? No. Oh. Savannah, odd. Uh, yeah. So, can I can I just get a confirmation, maybe, from uh, Mr. No. and uh, just about the service closures in the two health authorities, uh, and maybe as well, sort of what's projected to have to close next if we continue to see this uptick. Thank you very much for the question. Um, we are in a level now where we are trying to be nimble. Uh, in the red phase in our hospitals, we closed ORs almost completely, and we shut down all ambulatory services. And we found that was a bit of overkill. So what we are doing now is pulling back services when we need to to support uh, basic care. For example, uh, if we don't have enough staff to manage an operating room, if there are too many people in our ICUs, we have to turn down our, our surgery. Uh, we also have to turn down our access to ambulatory testing if there are too many people uh, in line waiting to get tests. So we start to restrict that. Uh, with our staffing crisis, we have to reduce the number of beds that are open on a given floor. A floor that might have had 36 beds in the past might have 28 now. So these are the, the steps that we make. In our ICUs, for example, as we get to a given level, we start to move patients to other hospitals, other facilities within the province. And so that means that we have to shut down surgeries completely at that facility and uh, may even punt surgeries to other facilities. So, so this hasn't been stated too much today, but we have such a staffing crisis where uh, when we see more people with COVID and more contacts amongst our staff. Today, there's 152 employees in Horizon that can't come to work because they are direct contacts and have been advised to self-isolate. That has a huge impact on our workforce. So, so we are fragile, but we are doing as much as we can. And every time something new hits, more people come in, more beds get filled, our emergency departments become more filled, we pull back incrementally in the services that we provide. So I can't say today that tomorrow we're shutting down ABC. Uh, partway through tomorrow, partway through the next day, we will start to pull back services. I completely agree with Dr. Dornan has mentioned, but I would like to add that uh, our priority is to maintain some services, to ma maintain the emergency services, intensive care unit services, and have the capacity to do the tracing for uh, COVID-19, have the capacity to, in fact, uh, find contacts in a reasonable time. And after that, in order to maintain these services, we need to cut 
in other services. So it's a bit like, a, well, like I said earlier, our capacity is stretched to the maximum. And if the uh, demand goes up in one sector, we need to uh, reduce services in other sectors. It can mean that uh, a surgical unit will close completely, a lab services will close, other services with uh, other healthcare professionals will, could cease. And that this could change tomorrow morning. Let's say that there is an outbreak within a hospital and we're not able to maintain an essential service. It's not impossible. And this is when we need to rely on the help of everyone. Now, let's say that uh, there, there are too many people in an ICU. We need to transfer patients in another hospital. So this is what we need to do daily and we are almost becoming experts at it. Dr. Dow. Bit um, louder, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just this one's for Dr. Dow. Um, you mentioned kind of the uh, reproduction rate for Delta versus the original strain of COVID. So I guess based on that, is there an idea of what our peak looks like in this wave based on the spread to date? Um, it depends uh, how how that uh, translates depends on um, what public health maneuvers you bring to bear. Now there were uh, a slate of um, interventions that were just announced at midnight Tuesday night. Those things are going to reduce the number of cases, and there are more things coming. The thing I would remind you is that um, when you bring these things in, you it takes about 10 to 14 days before you'll see those the effect of those changes. So um, Matthew could probably tell you better what his forecasting is. What I can tell you is that um, my, my expectation is that within two weeks we will see uh, a flattening of this, uh, of this curve. If you do have projections, that would be great. Um, so certainly under our current growth and under what we've seen so far, we do expect hospitalizations will continue rising for some time. To Dr. Dow's point, it will take some time for these measures to kind of bring, um, bring the expected on-ramping down. Uh, as far as final numbers or expected um, peaks, uh, I wouldn't share anything right now at this point uh, just because I think we need to evaluate some of these new measures uh, that have been announced and, and some of the things that we're doing that will be, uh, of course, as always, evidence-based. Uh, in, in the two intervening weeks, um, at, at any one time, I would say uh, between 35 and 40. 40 hospitalizations. Pascal Rochnock, Radio Canada. Good day. My question is for Dr. Desrosiers. There are many people who have talked about the importance of being tested. A screening test if, if someone has uh, symptoms or if you have close contacts. We have seen that the delays to get an appointment in order to, and also to get the results, it can take a lot of time and that can be very frustrating. So what is being done right now at Vitality in order to reduce these uh, delays for appointments and also for getting results? Thank you. We understand that this can be frustrating when one is waiting for a test result or for a test uh, per se. So in Vitalité, all the priority tests are dealt within 40, 24 hours. One needs to understand that there are various levels of priority for screening. If we're a high level uh, contact, there is a priority put on that person, and the person is being screened within 24 hours. And for the other types of requests that are not as uh, um, a priority, it is within 48 hours. There are only two sites right now that are closer to 48 hours than 24. These are Edmonston and Grand Falls, and we're re redeploying people, like I said earlier, in order to increase the number of hours of services provided. Monsieur Rachnog, would you have a follow-up question? Yes, 
In fact, we talked about an outbreak in the Saint Quentin Hospital recently. Could you please give us the vaccination rate regarding the staff at the Saint Quentin Hospital? The vaccination rate for the Vitality Network is over and beyond 88 percent, and the vaccination rate of our healthcare workers in the Saint Quentin Hospital is around 40 percent. Thank you. Derek Dubé. Derek Dubé, TVA. I would like to know with the figures that you provided earlier within public health, based on your expertise, maybe we could have been a little more prepared because there are many schools, in fact, that are being impacted in the province. Maybe we could have been predicted things a little better in order to protect the children of 12 and under who can't be vaccinated yet. Thank you, Mr. Dubé, for your question. Public health has collaborated with many departments within government in order to be prepared for the uh, pupils going back to school. And as mentioned by our colleagues, the Delta variant has a bigger impact than we uh, believed. And remember last year, during the biggest part of the pandemic and before a vaccination, there were very few transmissions within schools. And obviously, we have worked very hard in order to have measures in place. And since, we have put in place other measures in order to continue this work. Mr. Dubé, a quick follow-up, please. That's fine, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Vicky Horgard, CHEO. Thank you, Bruce. Dr. Dow, can you speak to how the Delta variant affects children in contrast to the original strain and other strains? Are they having more serious symptoms? Is it significantly more contagious? Um, and have there been any children under 12 hospitalized in New Brunswick um, to be treated for COVID-19? Um, well, first, to answer your last question, I'm not aware of any children under 12 hospitalized in New Brunswick, but someone in the Department of Health could probably verify that for you. Your other questions about pediatrics are really interesting. Um, at the start of this pandemic, children were in the minority of infections. But you remember, we weren't testing children. We were testing people with symptoms. And children, when they get infected, uh, uh, have mild symptoms most of the time. They have mild or no symptoms, in fact. So. Uh, what we're learning is that uh, Delta variant uh, certainly infects children um, effectively, efficiently. So it does infect children. They usually do not get particularly ill with it, which is good news, but some of them will. And uh, some children will even get um, so-called long COVID uh, symptoms. As far as transmission to others, it's also been shown that children will transmit the virus just as easily as an adult. And when we measure viral levels in the respiratory tract of children, they are as high as they are in, in adults. So the good news is our children um, do not get as sick. But yes, they, they do get infected. They do transmit the virus. And as far as the old strain, well, uh, it's hard to say. It looks like it didn't infect children quite as well. But at the same time, they weren't testing a lot of children uh, over a year ago, back when the pandemic began. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dow, I'm just wondering, as a follow-up, Pfizer said this week that um, their vaccine is safe for children 5 to 11 years old. How long do you think it will take before Canada approves a vaccine for children in that age group? I'm not sure, but naturally, uh, I would like to see it uh, as soon as possible. I would, I would hope within the next month or so, but uh, I am not sure what the timeline will be for Health Canada. Thank you. Brad Perry, CHCS News. Brad, do you have any questions? If not, I'm going to move to Hadil Ibrahim. 
Hi, thank you. Um, Dr. Dow, just to clarify um, before I go into my questions, were you involved in advising the province as an, as an expert? Um, I was up till July as part of the pandemic task force. Your question, okay, please. Thank you. Yes, if I understand correctly, we're here now even though we knew about Delta because we thought vaccination rates would be higher. Um, what would this teach us about making decisions based on predictions and trends and putting faith in people to do the right thing? Um, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. Would you mind that again, please? Yes, a few people asked you, you know, we knew this about the Delta variant before we went to green, but, you know, we were depending on, you know, trends um, and expectations that we would have higher vaccination rates to protect us, but that didn't happen. And we're seeing all these hospital hospitalizations and infections. So what do you think as an expert should this teach us about making decisions based on predictions and trends? Right. So what it tells us first off is that predictions are, are uh, ultimately guesses. They're educated guesses, but at the end of the day, an educated guess is still just a guess. So you bring up a very good point. When we make predictions, there is going to be a level of uncertainty around them. I think the big learning around this one is that our public health measures are incredibly, incredibly effective. And we should continue to uh, rely on them as an important layer that uh, we should uh, apply uh, along with vaccination. We really need to look at both those things. Now, what, what would I speculate going forward? As we have more and more vaccine protection going forward, you can loosen that layer. But uh, I think the big learning here is that we should continue to have uh, a lot of faith and use in our public health interventions. Thank you. I'm going to ask Adam Huris for Brunswick News. Do you have a question? Yes, please. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, thanks, doctors, for taking our questions. Um, my question is on community spread. Um, I just was hoping you could provide some details of where it's highest. Is that among schools, churches, restaurants? And, and can you provide some kind of breakdown where um, these cases are coming from? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so in terms of the spread that's been observed and, and the network that you've seen earlier, um, the locations of those clusters and gatherings uh, are, are varied. Um, I think the most salient part of it is that uh, these clusters are occurring mostly in un unvaccinated individuals. Uh, as far as specific types of gatherings that we have seen continued or uh, important spread, uh, I can say that about 10% of our cases um, over the past month that are part of that network are related to uh, worship type events. Mr. Hears, I'm just going to go to another colleague, if you don't mind, because we do have to set up for the press conference. Je vais aller à une autre personne pour poser des questions. We'll go to somebody else ask a question because uh, time is running out as we're going to have a press conference later. Travis Portman, have you... Erica Butler, do you have a question for the technical briefing? Yes, please. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's for Dr. Dow or Mr. Shalafu. Um, we heard lots of arguments against asymptomatic testing earlier in the pandemic. Um, although it has been used in other jurisdictions a lot more. Um, you mentioned the quick spread and shorter incubation period of, of the Delta. I'm wondering if that changes the calculus on the usefulness of asymptomatic testing, and at what point does it become useful? The, the utility of asymptomatic testing is still secondary. So uh, the first thing I would say, the first principle, is that testing is most appropriate for people with symptoms. Now, when it comes to um, the uh, best way to control spread of transmission, it's it, if you were, were to look at the different things we have in our menu, um, 
contact tracing and testing based on contact tracing and isolation based on risk is more important than random asymptomatic testing in a population. So while, while testing in an asymptomatic people in a population has a role, testing is still more, most appropriate for the symptomatic uh, persons in our population or those who have been identified as a high-risk contact. And that's really, uh, that's really something that's uh, been borne out uh, right around the world. So yeah, asymptomatic testing has a role, but it's secondary. Thank you. Um, Catherine Allard, Radio-Canada. Catherine Allard, Radio-Canada. Eloise Rodriguez Gilvash, Radio Canada. Yes, thank you, Bruce. It's a question for Dr. Shalifu and perhaps Dr. De Rosier as well. The approach at this time for the province is that healthcare workers who aren't fully vaccinated can choose to wear the mask and be tested frequently. But given what's happening in the province and given what's happening uh, elsewhere, uh, for example, uh, what's happening in Quebec, I mean, could this, would it be better? Better preventive care to do uh, that as well? Would it be better for healthcare workers in New Brunswick to all be vaccinated as well? Thank you for the question. Uh, certainly for our healthcare workers who already have a uh, uh, con uh, contracts with us, they have to be uh, screened three times a year and wearing a mask if they decide not to be vaccinated. For all new workers in the system, vaccination will be mandatory. Could we go further? That's a decision that is not mine to make. I believe that with our partners, we could discuss this and consider this, especially given the experience we've seen with our neighbors where there have been positive experiences. Thank you. We have to get this room ready for the press conference. Il faut qu'on prépare la salle pour We have to prepare this room for the press conference. Press conference questioning with the people that didn't get to ask their questions. Je m'excuse mille fois, mais il faut qu'on se prépare la salle. We have to prepare for the press conference so at, at 2.30. So I will start with the list with the people who haven't had a chance to ask questions yet.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les porte-paroles aujourd'hui sont dans l'ordre suivant. Sont la médecin hygiéniste en chef, le Dr. Jennifer Russell, le ministre de la Santé, Dorothy Shepard, et le premier ministre, Blaine Higgs, speaking on behalf of the province today in the following order. Dr. Jennifer Russell, the province's chief medical officer of health, the Honorable Dorothy Shepard, Minister of Health, and the Honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier of New Brunswick. Dr. Russell? Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Et aussi à toutes les journalistes qui sont ici. And also to all the uh, journalists who are here in the room today. I have a duty to inform you that three more New Brunswickers have passed away as a result of COVID-19. This includes a person between the ages of 70 and 79 from Zone 1, a person between the ages of 80 and 89 from Zone 1, and a person over 90 years of age from Zone 4. Each of these individuals has a family and friends who are now mourning their loss, and I join all New Brunswickers in sharing my heartfelt condolences with everyone who has been affected by these tragic deaths. This brings the total number of COVID-19 related deaths in the province to 52. Aujourd'hui, j'ai le triste devoir de vous informer que trois autres personnes du Nouveau-Brunswick sont décédées. I, I must now announce that Three more people from New Brunswickers have passed away as a result of COVID-19, and this includes a person between the ages of 70 to 79 from Zone 1, a person between the ages of 80 and 89 from Zone 1, and a person over 90 years of age from Zone 4. Each of these individuals has people and friends who are now mourning their loss, and I join all New Brunswickers in sharing my heartfelt condolences with everyone who has been affected by these tragic deaths who participated in the technical briefing for providing us with the important information about how COVID-19 is currently impacting our province. And for those who watched, I hope there is now a better understanding of the bigger picture in New Brunswick. It is clear that our current situation is very serious. If you did not see it, then you'll be able to watch it later on the Government of New Brunswick's YouTube channel. Throughout the COVID pandemic, we have acted to protect New Brunswickers. We have also acted to preserve the healthcare system that we all depend upon. And we have not hesitated to take action to limit the spread of this virus, and we will not hesitate now. The situation we are facing with the fourth wave of COVID-19 is very serious. It affects all of us, old and young, rural and urban, vaccinated and unvaccinated. We knew there would be more cases of COVID-19 after the mandatory order was lifted in July. We expected to see an increase in infections as people moved around the province and the country. But the pace of this fourth wave is beyond what we had anticipated. La quatrième vague de COVID-19 nous place dans... The fourth wave of uh, COVID-19 is very serious. It affects us all, old and young, rural and urban, uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated. We knew there would be more cases of COVID-19 after the mandatory order was lifted in July. We expected to see an increase in infections as people moved around the province and the country. But the pace of this fourth wave is beyond what we had anticipated. Being fueled by the Delta variant, which is more contagious than the original version, as mentioned by Dr. Gordon Dow. Without further action, we will see an even greater number of cases in the coming weeks, and even more New Brunswickers requiring hospital care. We are now at that tipping point. By acting now, we can stabilize the spread of the virus and reduce the strain on our healthcare system. 
Everyone is impacted by this fourth wave. Therefore, everyone needs to be part of the solution. Now, there may be some of you who believe that COVID-19 has become someone else's problem. If you are vaccinated, you might be feeling secure that you are protected against COVID-19. And it is true that vaccination does significantly reduce the risk of severe illness, hospitalization, and death, but the risk is still there. You can still catch COVID-19 and pass on the virus to the vulnerable, the elderly, and unvaccinated children. If you remain unvaccinated, perhaps you believe this disease will not affect you because of your age or current health status. But the greatest risk affects us all equally, and that is the risk that COVID-19 presents to our healthcare system. For the past week, we have been averaging around 67 new cases per day with hospital admissions rising by one patient per day. Today, there are 78 new cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick, and the full list will be on the GNB website, but I can tell you that we are seeing new cases in nearly every corner of our province. Et la plupart de ces cas nouveaux. And most of these new cases are amongst the unvaccinated. And at the current pace, by next week, we will be averaging up to 72 new infections each day, with an additional increase in severe illness and hospitalization. Fourth wave, just as we did in the first three waves of this pandemic. Depuis une semaine, nous signalons. For the past week, we've been uh, seeing 65 cases per day on average, with hospital admissions rising by one patient per day. Today, there are 78 new cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick, and the full list will be on the GNB website, but I can tell you that we are seeing new cases in every corner of our province. Most, but not all, of these new cases are amongst the unvaccinated. At this current pace, by next week, we will be averaging up to 72 new infections each day with an additional increase in severe illness and hospitalization. We can turn the tide on this fourth wave just as we did with the first three waves of this pandemic. ...is to get fully vaccinated. Our vaccination rate continues to rise slowly, but we still need more. And again, I ask that every New Brunswicker who is eligible to be vaccinated get their vaccination as soon as possible. With more infectious strains of the virus now in our province, we need every eligible person to get vaccinated. This is how we will slow the spread and reduce the number of active cases and hospitalizations. We announced this week that individuals who are immune comprom immunocompromised are now eligible to receive a third dose of an mRNA vaccine. These additional doses will provide people who may have a reduced immune response to COVID-19 vaccination with better protection against the virus. Nous avons annoncé plus tôt we announced uh, this, earlier this week that uh, people who are immunocompromised are now eligible to receive a third shot of an mRNA vaccine. This addi these additional doses will provide people who have a reduced immune response with better protection against the COVID-19. For this third dose of Pfizer BioNTech or Moderna vaccine is at least four weeks after receiving a second dose. Vaccinated or not, observing public health measures will also help to reduce the spread of COVID-19. We all need to maintain several layers of protection against the virus. Masks are again mandatory in indoor public spaces, and I'm greatly encouraged to see so many of you are taking this seriously. Masks will help prevent the spread of infection, and that will save lives. It also remains important to wash your hands regularly and thoroughly. And if you don't feel well, stay at home. Watch for symptoms of COVID-19 and seek testing if they appear in you or a member of your family. These are the tactics we all learned during the first year of the pandemic. Please keep using them. Due to the major surge in the number of COVID-19 cases, I'm aware that we are experiencing major delays at our assessment centers throughout our province. 
and I want to acknowledge that the significant demand for COVID-19 testing is leading to, strong, to longer than anticipated wait times to schedule an appointment and to receive test results. Wait times for testing varies depending on the location. Urgent requests are being booked within 24 hours, while others may have to wait a few days to receive an appointment. Je tiens à signaler que l'important de... I have to say that... Uh... I want to acknowledge that the significant demand for COVID-19 testing is leading to longer than anticipated wait times to schedule an appointment and to receive test results. Wait times for testing varies depending on the location and urgent requests are, requests are being booked within 24 hours while others may wait a few days to receive an appointment. are looking to enhance staffing resources at these locations to help reduce wait times and processing times. We are asking our partners to find ways to increase both hours of operation and capacity to help alleviate the longer than normal times for testing. We are asking our partners to find ways to increase both hours of operation and capacity to alleviate the longer than normal times for testing. I ask that you please be patient with people working at the assessment centers. They are doing everything in their power to test people as quickly as possible and provide results in a timely manner. After learning more about our current situation, it's understandable if you're concerned about what this means for your children, especially those who are attending school. I want to assure you that public health is committed to keeping every classroom and every teacher and every student healthy and safe. And we work very closely with our partners at EECD to ensure that we stay in close contact about the situa situations as they evolve. While we are seeing children under 19 contract this virus, for now those numbers remain low, thankfully, and none are currently hospitalized. And as Dr. Dow alluded to, generally we don't see children becoming so ill that they require hospitalization, but we know that it can happen. And this is why we have the measures in place that we have currently. For the most part, infections of students occurred outside of school in gatherings of family and friends rather than in the classroom. And we all must do our best to keep our lives running as normally as possible. And again, public health measures should never exceed the risks. And we've always been trying to balance that no matter the situation throughout the pandemic. We know the benefit of keeping children in the classroom goes a long way and the positive impact it has on their overall well-being, social and mental health. Again, we've always taken into account the social determinants of health with our public health recommendations and measures. We know that COVID-19 will continue to be with us for some time. Masks and other restrictions may continue to be necessary in the months ahead as the Delta and other variants move through our communities. In time, we will move beyond this pandemic, hopefully, although we don't know how many years it will take. Um, but as Dr. Bonnie Henry referred to recently in, a, in an interview, that we'll, we'll, be within, we'll be living with this for some time. We will get to the point, hopefully, that we're able to live with this virus in the least invasive way possible, but that's hard to determine and measure at this point. But what we will continue to maintain and manage is our healthcare system and preventing it from becoming overwhelmed. So to reach that point now more than ever, we need to remember that we are all in this together. And that is a really difficult thing to think about right now when people are stressed and concerned and anxious. But it has worked in the past, we've gotten this far, and we all must continue to work together to turn this tide of this fourth wave. Thank you very much, merci. Good afternoon, bonjour. Before we begin today, I would like to offer my sincere condolences to the loved ones of the three people who have passed away as a result of COVID-19. Learning that three New Brunswickers have lost their lives to this virus in a single day is tragic and I know we are all feeling the impact of this shocking news. My thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of these individuals during this difficult time. 
These past three weeks have shown us that COVID-19 and the variants of concern are not going away easily. Given the opportunity to infect hosts, this virus will continue to spread. We are now experiencing a surge unlike anything we have witnessed in our province. In a short time frame, we have gone from a very manageable 10 cases a day to an average of 67 cases per day, and we expect that number to continue to rise. It's concerning, it's upsetting, and it's frightening. Despite the successes we've had in the past, we must now recognize that COVID-19 is a virus that will manage to find the weakest link and impact our healthcare system, something we have worked so very hard to prevent. The majority of New Brunswickers have done what we've asked them to do, but it is clear we need to take extra measures and precautions to regain the upper hand. The information already provided during today's technical briefing and by Dr. Russell, and the further details that will be delivered shortly by the Premier, empowers us with the knowledge that once again, we can stifle this virus. Today, our government's top concern is the impact COVID-19 is having and will continue to have on New Brunswick's healthcare system if this fourth wave continues on its current trajectory. Our healthcare system is fragile and we are aware of its challenges and vulnerabilities. We know that treating a patient with severe illness caused by COVID-19 requires more resources than treating patients hospitalized with other illnesses. A patient in the ICU with COVID-19 often requires one-on-one, -on -one, 24 hour care. In most cases, even if the COVID-19 patients are not in ICU, they require oxygen and will need one-on-one -on -one nursing care. A recent report by the Canadian Institute for Health Information showed that people who are hospitalized with COVID-19 typically remain in hospital for approximately 15 days, which is twice as long as a typical pneumonia patient. In addition, the report found that the average COVID-19 patient in the ICU stays in hospital for 21 days and is much sicker than other patients. COVID-19 patients who recover after being on a ventilator often require treatment from multiple health professionals, such as physiotherapists and respiratory therapists. If the number of cases, hospitalizations, and ICU admissions continue to rise, it will impact all New Brunswickers. If our hospitals become overwhelmed, we will need to cut back on other health care services, including regular appointments and routine surgeries. In a worst case scenario, health care professionals would need to make heartbreaking decisions about who to care for, and some patients could be turned away. Our health care workers are already feeling the strain as our contact tracers and other public health employees. We know that the likelihood of becoming severely ill from COVID-19 is much lower among the vaccinated. I continue to urge anyone who has not yet been vaccinated to book an appointment right away. The vaccine is the very best tool we have to protect from severe illness if we have been exposed to COVID-19. This week, our government introduced new measures to slow the spread and encourage higher vaccination rates. We now need to wear a mask indoor spaces, register our travel when entering New Brunswick, and show proof of we are fully vaccinated when accessing certain businesses, services, or events. Due to the rising number of cases and hospitalizations, public health has recommended some additional regulations to further protect New Brunswickers and Premier Higgs will provide more details about those measures in just a moment. There have been many times throughout this pandemic when we've needed to take a step back and reconsider our response. With the guidance of public health, we are constantly assessing our approach and making appropriate adjustments as needed to ensure we are doing what is necessary to protect New Brunswickers, while also trying to live our lives as normally as possible. We have managed to turn things around time and time again as we've moved through the waves of the pandemic. 
I am confident we can get back on track once again by working together and following the rules that are put in place. Please continue to do your part to protect yourself, your family, your friends, and your neighbors. Thank you. Merci. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Marsh and I were saddened to learn that three New Brunswickers have died as a result of complications from COVID-19. On behalf of all New Brunswickers, I want to offer my sincere condolences to their family and friends. Please know that our thoughts and prayers are with you as you grieve these tragic losses. As both Minister Shepherd and Dr. Russell explained, the situation we currently face in New Brunswick is indeed serious. That is why, on the advice of public health, Cabinet is reinstating a state of emergency and bringing in a mandatory order as of 11.59 p.m. tonight. This is in addition to the Public Health Act measures put in place on Wednesday. Under the mandatory order, there is a return to household bubbles, which will include your household, plus up to 20 consistent contacts, the steady 20 we have had earlier this year. Lorsqu'on prouve de plan when with a proof of vaccination is not necessary to enter a business, an event, or a service like uh, going to the grocery store or private businesses, social distancing of two meters is required. Gatherings are limited to your 20 consistent contacts. Businesses and events where people gather or exercise including museums, movie theaters, bingo halls, amusement centers, arenas, weddings and funerals, must ensure all employees are fully vaccinated or continuously masked and tested regularly. Les entreprises du New Brunswick. Businesses here in the province of New Brunswick, in fact, can get information regarding the access, regarding quick uh, testing for their employees by contacting the Chamber of Commerce of the region. That all participants show proof of full vaccination or they may choose to implement alternative public health measures to protect congregants from COVID-19. These measures include operating at 50% capacity, the continuous use of masks, maintaining two meters of physical distance between attendees from different households, no congregational singing, either recording the names of attendees and gather contact information by row or pew or having a consistent assigned seating plan for the purposes of contact tracing, and preventing parishioners with COVID-19 symptoms and those who have been instructed to self-isolate from entering the venue. Improve the vaccination complete et exige. Full vaccination is necessary for funerals, for weddings or special services, and no social gathering is authorized. Just as long as uh, physical distancing can be maintained, there are no limits for gatherings outside. It is unfortunate to return to a state of emergency. However, it is necessary. Our province must take these steps now. We need to slow the spread of COVID-19 and ensure the number of hospitalizations does not continue to rise. The current rate of growth in cases of COVID-19, and especially of hospitalizations due to COVID-19, is a serious and eminent risk to public health in New Brunswick, to the health and safety of all New Brunswickers, and to the continuity of function of critical health services in New Brunswick and constitutes a public health and health care emergency. We need all New Brunswickers to take urgent action, regardless of vaccination status, to slow the spread of COVID-19. That is why these measures and the return to the mandatory order are required. The situation is serious, and we need people to take it seriously. La rete obligatoire sera The mandatory order will be reviewed every two weeks. Just like we did since the beginning of the pandemic, we will continue 
to monitor the situation and work closely with public health in order to find the best way of doing things. Mr. Shepard explained, our main concern is the impact COVID-19 is having on our health care system. That is why hospitalization are now the trigger for us to move back and forth from public health measures to the mandatory order. The mandatory order will come into effect when we have 25 or more people hospitalized due to COVID-19 in New Brunswick, a situation we are in today with 31 in hospital. We must do this because of the strain this number of hospitalizations puts on our healthcare system. As hospitalizations decrease, the mandatory order and the public health measures will remain in effect to ensure our hospitalizations stabilize. La droite obligatoire sera levé. The mandatory order will be lifted and the number of hospitalizations in the province will be at 10% or lower. Once this happens, the province of New Brunswick, in fact, uh, will put in place the measures that are already in place today. These measures are necessary so that the number of hospitalizations because of this illness be manageable. ...of COVID-19. It is not about case numbers. If those cases, it is those cases that lead to hospitalizations and threaten our entire healthcare system that are of a concern. Right now, 31 people are hospitalized and 15 people are in ICU due to COVID-19. 27 or 87 percent of those people are not fully vaccinated. Of the 37 people who were hospitalized between July 1st and September 22nd, only five were fully vaccinated, while three were partially vaccinated. 29 or 79 or 78 percent were unvaccinated. While people age 40 and older who are unvaccinated have accounted for 33% of the total number of COVID-19 cases in New Brunswick since July 1st, they have represented 83% of hospitalizations. I'm talking people 40 and over, many 40 to 50. Above 60, we're in a range where most of, almost 90% are fully vaccinated. This pandemic has constantly changed and is imperative that we are able to adapt as well. Having the ability to move back and forth between public health measures and the requirements of the mandatory order gives us the flexibility we need to face these challenges while keeping our healthcare system in balance and to live life as normally as possible. If you choose not to follow the rules and put your fellow New Brunswickers at risk, there will be consequences to your actions. Spot checks will be conducted at the borders and at businesses, and fines will be issued. Under the mandatory order for each instance of noncompliance, the minimum fine is $480, and the maximum fine is $20,400. Unfortunately, some who choose not to be vaccinated have also been shown to be less likely to self-isolate when required to do so or get tested, or wear a mask. Vous êtes bien sur libre. The Obviously, you are free to make your own decisions. But measures need to be put in place in order to protect the community when these decisions put other people in danger. As the situation has become a pandemic of those who are not vaccinated, the the greater the number of active cases are high, and the risks of uh, the risks are higher for people who are contaminated, and those who do not get vaccinated or can't be vaccinated are at risk. Times more likely to be hospitalized than those fully vaccinated. While unvaccinated individuals 40 years of age and older are 31 times more likely to be hospitalized than those fully vaccinated. And they make up the vast majority of our current cases in hospitals. If you have not had your first or second dose of COVID-19 vaccine, I urge you to go to, to a walk-in clinic or book an appointment through a self, through a participating pharmacy or a Vitality or Horizon Health Network clinic as soon as you possibly can.
Plus le nombre de gens vaccinés est élevé. The greater the number of people are vaccinated, the better we increase our chances of getting out of this. I truly appreciate that the, for those who got vaccinated. In fact, this is an important step that they took in order to protect themselves and protect their loved ones. I appreciate that so many of you are choosing to follow the measures now in place and that you will continue to follow further restrictions under the mandatory order when they go into effect at 11.59 p.m. Everything you are doing is having an impact. You get to choose what kind of impact that will ultimately be. None of this is easy, but we will get through this the same way we have gotten here thus far, by working together. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Premier Ministre. We'll now proceed with questions from members of the media. Each reporter will have one question. You have the right to pose your question in the official language of your choice. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez le droit de poser votre question dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question. Andrew Waugh, Brunswick News. Tom Bateman, Brunswick News. Hi, can you hear me? A little louder, bud. How about now? Perfect. Great. So listen, we heard last week about some strain on contact tracing capacity in this province. And I think uh, Dr. Dow's presentation kind of uh, framed that in interesting terms. Um, Dr. Russell, how many people are doing contact tracing in the province right now? And can you explain whether we need more capacity in, in contact tracing and how that will be achieved? Thank you. Hi, Tom. Um, there's no question that it is a challenge right now with respect to uh, the number of people that have COVID and, and their number high number of contacts in the different settings. But it really is our top priority right now. And um, it is a multifaceted uh, procedure process because um, we have public health folks that work on it, uh, not just the nursing staff, but we've got inspectors working on it. Um, and we have multiple partners from uh, Extramural, Ambulance New Brunswick, Education, Early Childhood, and we also have at the federal level uh, the Stats Canada folks who help us with that as well. Um, this, re this recent surge um, really has obviously stretched the resources, there's no question. Um, and so we are also including uh, partnerships with EECD staff uh, to help with the distribution of public health directives uh, to contacts in the school system. And since the beginning of September, we have had uh, added more interviewers, including approximately 30, uh, I just mentioned that, from the Statistics Canada program. And, um, and we will continue to assess and onboard any other available resources right now to assist with contact tracing. And um, I guess for the public, it's really important that if you do receive a notification from public health, either by way of letter or phone call, uh, it is important that individuals comply with those directives to self-isolate, et cetera. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. Bobby Jean McKinnon, CBC. Can you follow up, Bruce? I'm trying to squeeze everybody Sorry. in. Bobby Jean no. McKinnon. Bobby Jean. Sarah Seely, Brunswick News. Can you hear me? A little louder, but yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Russell, uh, how many of the unvaccinated cases involve children under 12 who are too young to be vaccinated? And how many involve people who can't be vaccinated because of medical or other conditions? And why doesn't the province provide these figures routinely on the dashboard?
Yeah, I think uh, what we provide on the dashboard in terms of the breakdown, um, it's usually as a percentage, but um, and the way we present the data is, I think, pretty similar across the country. Um, and I'm not sure if Matsu Shadiflu presented the information on how many cases of COVID um, in terms of uh, cases that are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I know he showed a slide uh, of all of the cases in terms of which ones are vaccinated, um, but I don't have the breakdown in cases uh, of vaccinated versus unvaccinated the way you're asking for. I'm going now to Sarah Seeley, Brunswick News. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, Sarah, go ahead. Excellent. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Shepard. I was just wondering if the province was aware of the impact of uh, the surge in cases on emergency departments and what actions are being taken to address that. I, I think Dr. Dow, uh, or Dr. Um, sorry, Dr. John Dornan, um, interim CEO at Horizon, spoke very well about this in that um, absolutely uh, COVID has an impact on every area of our hospital system right now. So at the ER in particular, um, I think our biggest challenge with the ER is, of course, uh, COVID protocols, but also uh, staff. We, um, it has been a challenge all summer long. Uh, we knew it would be a challenge. We knew that we would be continuing to be challenged in this area. And so the RHAs are, of course, tasked with making sure that they can keep their services at a safe uh, at a safe level for employees and for patients visiting. So the RHAs will make any decisions they need to make in order to protect their staff and, uh, and the patients who are coming there for service. Thank you, Minister. Frédéric Camarano, Radio-Canada. Louise Rodriguez, Radio-Canada. Catherine Allard, Radio-Canada. Brad Perry, CHSJ. Brad Perry, CHSJ. Andrew Waugh, Brunswick News. Can you hear me? Perfectly, yeah, bud. Me? Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Premier, I listened to what you just, uh, your opening remarks, and we just listened to Dr. Dow say that it was a mistake to reopen on the 30th of July. Uh, you've recently said you wouldn't do anything differently. Um, now we've got these cases rising, we've got these new measures. Do you have any regrets? Do you feel like you need to say sorry to New Brunswickers for the situation we're now in? I am obviously not very happy about the situation we're in today. And my comments previously about um, the decision made back in, in July 31st was based on the facts that, that we had available to us and, and, the, and where we were in the pandemic of the time. Um, it, was, it was the right thing to do for New Brunswick. It was the right thing to do in relation to us getting to see his family again and to have a, a summer. Uh, back with family as we don't know how long this is going to ultimately last and so to get a reprieve and we had been in a good position in our province for some time so I know it's uh, it's convenient to try to get a gotcha moment here but my point is this with the facts that were available at the time and with us looking at where we were as a province at the time I would have made the same decision then uh, that, that, um, that I did if you look back and you say well in hindsight would you have done anything differently? Well, you know, there's probably through my life, there's lots of times in hindsight I would do things differently. And, and yes, could this be one of them in, in hindsight? But I have to reiterate that the decision we made at the time um, were based on the facts available and the situation our province w um, was in and how we would go forward. It's always easy to look back. Um, so I'm right now, we're reacting to the situation we're in. As you know, this really kind of came after September a long weekend, and, and then it has, has ramped up quickly, and that's why we're, 
we're taking these measures quickly and we'll continue to do that as we've done. But we have acted as a team throughout this entire pandemic and we faced it together as all in the Brunswickers and we will continue to do that and I'm confident just as we've survived the first 19 months, we will get through this and we will be diligent in doing whatever's necessary to protect the citizens of this province. Thank you. We're going to cycle through questions real quickly. Tim Roselle, Global. Thank you, Bruce. My question is for Dr. Russell. Um, Dr. Russell, just given that uh, the, the restrictions that are coming into effect under the mandatory order, uh, you know, we've got the, the steady 20 reinstated with households, uh, limits on indoor gatherings and things like that. How challenging is it going to be and, and, and how can you sort of rationalize doing that while leaving uh, you know, gyms, sports venues, concert theaters, and things like that open for, for larger style gatherings? Yeah, great question. It, it really is a different situation now be, based on the fact that we do have a large amount of our population vaccinated. So that's really what we took into account when we made the recommendations about the current measures. Um, it was really based on targeting the higher risk areas where we knew transmission was occurring, uh, predominantly among unvaccinated uh, folks in indoor settings, not wearing masks and no distancing. So when you take put that into the equation with the population that we know are vaccinated, and the places where we will require proof of vaccination, that's the balance that we're, we're, we're striving for in terms of reducing those risks right now. Thank you. Allison Sampson. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, wondering at what point will you consider dropping this state of emergency? I know we're just entering it today, but do you have any parameters that you have already considered um, for this to end? Yes, we do. It, it's all based on hospitalizations and, um, and currently we're in at 31. We, we said the trigger was 25. Um, but going back, we won't, draw, we won't reduce the state of emergency at 25. We want to get back to 10 and have that, that 10 threshold be stabilized. So that'll be the, the next trigger will be a stabilized level at, at 10 or lower. Alexander Boudreau. Could you give a little more details regarding the the prompt teams, they're in 15 places here in the province. I'm wondering if this has an impact on the services that are being provided. In fact, were they ready to uh, respond immediately? Without a doubt, the uh, work that has been done by the prompt team is extraordinary. And in fact, that there are many places here in the province where we have our prompt teams. It, there are challenges. What I can tell you, will, will, will this change the services that are being provided, I can't tell you. However, I can tell you that they do excellent work, they work very hard, but it's very tiring as well, I have to say that. Jacques Poitras. Premier, you talked about not being close to the 90% new goal for uh, vaccinations last week, referencing the 86 and some for eligible people, but Dr. Dow said it, the, the goal is 90% of the entire population. So I just want to clarify, is that is that the goal? And how realistic is 90% of the entire population? Well, Dr. Russell may be in a better position to answer this than I, but, but it's very difficult to have 90% of the entire population. And, and considering that we're, we're kind of, you know, hovering around the 12% the, um, or 10% that just uh, are choosing not to get vaccinated who could, um, that's, that's a problem. So in, in, I think the thing to remember about all of this, I mean, we don't have vaccines that are readily available for the younger population, but we're also not seeing the sickness in the younger population. We're not seeing the hospitalization rates. We're seeing very low levels of, of symptoms. And so that, that at this stage continues with the, with the variant. So um, I, I guess achieving uh, a level of 90% um, of in the entire population, uh, although I respect that, that is our target, will be extremely difficult. Now hospitalizations are the trigger. Hospitalization because we realize that that our our goal has to be and and where are people in the hospital? That's why I, I emphasize today so much about 40, 40 to to sixty really, because about sixty we're, we're seeing full vaccinations and and the current fatalities we have, you know there there are mitigating circumstances that go with those in many cases, but we have hospitalizations at a high high level of individuals between forty and sixty, and those are not are unvaccinated. So readily available to be vaccinated could have a huge impact on the level of hospitalizations, uh, but are choosing not to. 
Thank you, Doug Dickinson, Brunswick News. Vicki Hogarth, CHCO. Can you hear me? Oh, hang on, Vicki. Yes, Doug, a little louder, please. Yes, uh, yes uh, for the uh, Premier, uh, with the rising cases in the Upper River Valley in Zone 3, uh, what concerns are ever for the region? Uh, I know there's a lot of churches and places of worship in the region. Uh, how important are these new measures for churches? Doug, uh, Minister Shepherd's coming up to answer. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, so, of course, the Upper River Valley and uh, Dr. Uh, John Dornan spoke to that today with regards to the fact that some services have had to be curtailed in the Upper River Valley, um, particularly obstetrics. Um, and, and you know, we, we have to continually assess every single day they have an in-brief and an out-brief to analyze what's happening. With regards to faith gatherings, I first want to say thank you to the faith community. We've had uh, several conversations um, over this last week to try to find a sweet spot that would really help them um, uh, be better prepared for their congregations. So um, I've shared with them last night um, uh, new policies and we, we, we know that um, fully vaccinated is, is the very best uh, congregation, but we also know that the faith-based community, um, you know, are, are just um, innately responsive to anyone who comes to their door. So we have provided the faith community with two options um, into how they run their services, um, their weekly services. So any activity going on in their building throughout the week it will be necessary to have proof of vaccination for people to participate in those, whether they be um, congregation members or whether they be outside groups who are utilizing the business. But beyond that, for services, for weekly services, they have an option. So they can, they can ask for proof of vaccination. And when they do ask for proof of vaccination, they still must continue to mask at all times. But social distancing won't be required. There is no capacity issue, and singing while masked will be permitted. The second option, if they don't choose to ask for proof of vaccination, and they believe that they could be potentially having someone at their service who is not vaccinated, then they must have everyone masked at all times. They must operate at 50% capacity. They will maintain two meters of physical distancing between households. There's no congregational singing. Records of names for all attendees and contact information by row or have a consistent assigned seating plan for contact tracing. And they must prevent anyone displaying COVID-19 symptoms or who have been instructed to self-isolate from entering. This is one strict policy or another strict policy. And thanks to the faith community for helping work with us. This is, a, uh, this is I believe, a way that, um, that, that churches can operate and feel comfortable about what they're doing. Thank you. Vicki Hogarth, do you have a quick question? I do. Um, I don't know who it's for, though. Uh, unvaccinated staff are still able to work in businesses where a proof of vaccination is required of the customers. Can you provide us with more details on how and where and when the unvaccinated staff are tested and who's monitoring this in businesses like restaurants. Thank you, Vicki. Um, we are saying regular testing. So at GNB, that's three times a week, but in the private sector world, it could be three or two times a week. And um, employees must remain masked at all times while they're on the place of place of business. So I think, does that answer your question? So the, the, the testing takes place, uh, usually I believe on the premises, the tests are provided by the chamber in, your area, in the area uh, for businesses, and, um, and they, can, they have instructions on how to complete the, uh, the, the local test. Thank you. Pascal Rochnag, Radio-Canada. Oui, bonjour. Uh, Thank you. My question, I don't know who uh, would be answering it, but it's regarding the uh, bubble concept of 20 people. During the last uh, 
we, we, last time we included 20 people, people from a household. So I'm wondering, what is the definition regarding 20 people? Does that include households in which we are or the people we're in contact with? Good afternoon. And in fact, if you have people who live in uh, your house, let's say you have four people who live with you, so it's a total of 20 contacts for the household. Around gathering restrictions, uh, Premier Higgs mentioned family bubbles and uh, private gathering restrictions and face-based gatherings. Uh, I, I was wondering, and it's a little further to what Tim had asked, if uh, crowd sizes at bigger events are facing any kind of limitations, specifically a week out from the start of the QMJHL season, uh, arenas are selling at full capacity. Are those games in a week going to be allowed to play for full crowds? So I'll take that one. Um, as long as um, the events like this now must, um, must only accept individuals who provide proof of full vaccination. So capacity is not a problem when you have full vaccination. And so this is, um, this is how the policy will continue. With regards to the household plus 20, um, Dr. Dow explained how the contacts of individuals are now, um, and, and the, potential, the potential spread of the virus is exponentially growing. So if we can take our, our contacts to a household plus 20, then if and when a, a virus outbreak happens in that household, the number of people that the contact tracers have to track down is much more manageable. Thank you. Erica Butler, CHMA. Hi there. Um, I, I know that the province is distributing rapid test kits to New Brunswick businesses for use with their employees. Will you also use these test kits for schools, daycares, or nursing homes? And if so, how soon will people have access to them? Hi, yes, at this stage we are using the point of care testing for uh, businesses. Um, the Chamber of Commerce's, uh, Chambers of Commerce around the province have been helping us with that. Um, but as of right now, we're, we're, we're sticking with that particular uh, rollout. Um, can we move to something different in the future? We can definitely have conversations with th about that. But right now we're not using those rapid tests um, widely in all those different settings, just in that business settings right now. Um, they, we, the, the, the rapid tests that are used in other provinces, obviously we have access to them here. My understanding is in other provinces there are some shortages. Um, but right now, again, the PCR-based testing is our primary uh, mode of testing for many different reasons, which we've discussed in the past around accuracy, et cetera. But, uh, but certainly we, we can still continue to have discussions around uh, further, um, uh, further evolution of our testing. Hadil Ibrahim, CBC. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Um, it's my understanding that the COVID uh, task force was disbanded um, in July of July fifteenth. Um, was that because we were going to green, and will it come back now that the emergency order is back on? And um, was it involved in making the decision to go to green? The um, the COVID task force was um, in. Uh, in position until we actually went to green and it, and went and, and uh, suspended the mandatory order. So um, now that the mandatory order is is uh, is back as of midnight tonight, um, I have extended the uh, um, an invitation to my colleagues um, of the uh, and leaders of the other parties um, to once again reassemble the uh, COVID uh, cabinet group. And um, and at this point, they're they're um, contemplating that we we just talked about it um, yesterday. Okay, I, I, sorry, Thank I was you. referencing the pandemic task force, the one that Dr. Russell was in and Dr. Dow. Okay, sorry, the pandemic task force. So, so is it, has it been disbanded? And Hang is on, it going to be deal. back on? Hang on, okay, deal. I was just clarifying. Oh, they heard you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, at that time, certainly, again, um, moving forward after green, uh, my understanding is we weren't going to continue to meet 
accept on an ad hoc basis, uh, and we can definitely revisit that. Certainly having Dr. Dow and Dr. Desrosiers part of the conversation and the technical briefing today was great. And um, uh, and again, it's been great to work with them throughout the, the, the last 18 months in that capacity. Uh, but we've certainly kept in touch. We've certainly had regular meetings and conversations. Uh, if we need to um, to bring back the pandemic task force as, as we had paused it, uh, then we certainly will do that. Thank you. Oh, Minister. The pandemic task force was instrumental in helping us make decisions within the RHAs. And that was really why it was pulled in. And certainly they gave provice and, and, and had input every day with our, with our um, daily, daily briefings, et cetera. The task force was um, quite specifically um, engaged for the purpose of making quick decisions of policy within the RHAs and our nursing homes, long-term care sector. Thank you. Derek Dubé. Savannah Odd. in the testing centers of vaccine clinics and now we're seeing a lot of staff in hospitals off for COVID related reasons. I'm wondering at what point the province will look to other provinces for reinforcements for staff and uh, if you're considering calling in the military at this point and if not now, what would trigger that? So I'm not a clinical person, but I will say this, is that yes, it's been challenging. Um, and uh, the, biggest, um, the biggest challenge of backlog right now is in testing. And so we are, we're looking at all options within the healthcare networks uh, to help provide um, support to our testing centers. At this time, there is no consideration for bringing in the military. Um, and I would, I would have to give, um, get counsel from our RHAs, CEOs, and uh, and A and B extramural public health to whether or not a measure such as that would be necessary. At this time, we're working through it. We're asking those who have not been asked by public health or are not symptomatic to, to not, um, not consider getting a PCR test right now. Let, let the backlog clear. If you are symptomatic, of course, call. But if public health hasn't asked you to be tested, then um, then you're, you don't have to be tested, right? If, if you're in a school that has had an exposure, if, con if public health hasn't told you to get tested, you don't need to get tested. Sorry, so, sorry, just to clarify, you only want people who are symptomatic to call to get a test? That's the instruction right now? Symptomatic or close contacts, and that's defined by public health. Okay. Last question to Adam Harris. Um, to Premier Higgs, knowing how this unfolded, are you now promising to be more cautious in ending protocols? I know you said 10 hospitalizations to remove the mandatory order, but is the message today not that we need to live with restrictions for the foreseeable future? Well, we don't have any, uh, we have, mess we have uh, restrictions in place at this point in time that could heighten or could lessen depending on where we are with hospitalization. I think that message has been has been very clear. And, and I think throughout the entire entire um, COVID experience um, from the beginning, you know, we've reacted as necessary. We, we, we felt that we were in a good position uh, through the summer and we were right up until the, the um, I guess certainly after Labor Day and then the time lapse in between that and then seeing where we are now. But, but the, cl the, the triggers are clear, the triggers of hospitalization and, and of, of 25, the, the triggers that certainly to to keep the mandatory order, but it doesn't get relaxed until we get below 10 and we're stabilized below 10. So I'm hopeful that we would be able to get a, a back to a, um, our normality, uh, more so than what we're introducing today. But um, I guess time will tell. Uh, we, we're hopeful this will make a difference for sure. We're confident that uh, it'll have to make some difference and uh, we'll go deeper if necessary. But right now, I, I guess the message is consistent um, if we can get those 40-somethings, 50-somethings completely vaccinated, it'll have a huge impact on our hospitalization. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Thank you, Minister Shepard. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. That concludes Back today's to update today's and up. technical briefing. Thank you. Voilà la fin de notre mise à jour puis notre séance d'information. Merci puis bon weekend. <laughs>